Um, what I'd like to do very quickly to begin with is to take everybody to the not so distant past, if I may. Um, and what I'd like to do is throw out a few concepts and I want you to think about what comes to mind as I say certain things. For example, if I say check in at a hotel, we've all done that in the past and we all remember how to do that. But the moment I say that, that phrase, check in at a hotel, an odd thing happens. For all of us, our mind calls up a visualization or a visual representation of where we think that event takes place. It's something that looks akin to this. And while this might not be a perfect representation of what you're seeing in your mind's eye, it is very similar. Now, an interesting odd series of other things happen. Again, just that expression, check in at a hotel, causes other things to pop up. Not only do you know where you are and what the space looks like, you also know who is there. You expect someone to not just be there, but they'll be positioned in a certain location behind the check-in desk. They'll be wearing a certain kind of clothing or a certain uniform in that position. And again, this is a default thing. Now, more importantly, you know that they're going to use certain tools or technologies for this process. You expect them to have a computer that they will use to check your registration and to register you with that hotel. You also know that at some point you'll be asked to provide a credit card and in many cases, sign a receipt that confirms your check-in at the location. None of this is surprising. You just know it will happen and you know the objects that are involved. But most importantly, <clears throat> after this process is completely finished, you expect that person to hand you something, a key card. Without any explanation, you know what you will receive and you know how to use it. All of this happens reflexively, instantaneously, and we tend to not think about what's going on here. But in reality, we're dealing with some incredibly complicated mental processing issues that for most of us, it should stop us cold in our tracks, the amount of data our senses have to process, or our senses bring in for our brain to process, yet it doesn't. What is going on? Why is that happening? And how can we use this phenomenon of these reflexive responses to understand usability and address aspects of user experience design? To kind of discuss these issues, I'd like to change the scenario just slightly. Imagine that I present the same situation. You're going to check in at a hotel. You pop that mental model open again and you walk into the space and you encounter this. Now, most of us have never seen this kind of registration area in a hotel before. And chances are we will default to do one of three things. Some of us will actually leave that space, go back out the entrance and look at the front of the building to confirm we're actually in the right place. We'll think about it for a second, then we'll walk back in. We might walk out a few more times to confirm it, but there'll be this check, am I in the right location? Some of us will start to wander around and ask anybody who's in the area, uh, is this whatever the hotel is? Uh, how do I check in? And some of us will just freeze and stand there and wait and watch for someone else to come in and hopefully observe their behavior and mirror it to figure out what, to go, what goes on in that space. But when you think about it, the simple change in the visual representation of that space, that hotel check-in area, has cut a reflexive process off and forced us into a state of complete indecision, panic and freezing, which is something we never want in usability. So let's say that we've walked into this space. Now, our gut instinct tells us there's going to be someone there who will check us in. Where are they? They're not in their regular location. So you scan the area, you search around until you can find someone who just happens to be sitting there checking their phone. And you ask that person, um, excuse me, do you know where the check-in attendant is? And that person responds, oh, it's me. And you're kind of taken aback. Well, you're in the wrong place and you're not dressed in the uniform I'm expecting. Are you sure you're the check-in agent? Oh yeah, just give me your credit card and I'll sign you in. Now, most of us are gonna be very hesitant to give this stranger in the wrong place without a uniform, our personal financial information. So there might be some back and forth here. And then we ask the person, well, do I need to check in? Do you need to process anything in your system? To which they respond, oh yeah, I've already processed you. Um, I was doing it the entire time you were talking to me with my mobile phone. Now again, for many of us, this is gonna stop us cold. Something is not adding up here. 
uh, you're not supposed to use a mobile phone to check me in at a hotel, particularly not what I think is your personal mobile phone. You're supposed to use a, a desktop, someplace I can see it and I know what's going on. Well, no worries, the attendant in theory tells you. Uh, here, just sign this and move forward. And they hand you something. Now, many of us might say, okay, I kind of get the idea that's a pen, but I'm a little heck hesitant right now because I've never been in a hotel where they've given me this kind of object to sign something with. So I'm re feeling really unsure about what's going on. Can I just have my key and go to my room? And the person claiming to be the attendant says, sure. And they reach in their pocket and they pull out something that looks like this. Basically, they give you this ring and say, okay, here, just slide it on and go up and open your room up. And again, what is this thing? I don't know what it is. I certainly don't know how to use it. I'm very confused. And the attendant tells you, oh, what you do is quite simply, there's a computer chip embedded into the surface of the ring. Instead of a key card so that you don't lose it, you put this on your finger and you just go up and hold the ring up to the door and it opens it the same way a key card would. Now, even if you get through this process intact, you'd feel highly uncomfortable and you'd probably very doubt that everything was safe and secure and might wanna double check everything. If you got that far in the process and didn't decide, I'm done here, I'm going to find someplace else. But what's going on? Because when you think about it, you've engaged in the exact same activity involving the same individuals and objects in a parallel space, but the visual design of things isn't matching up. And that failure to match visual design is affecting your ability to use objects and perform activities in that space. And even if you do complete a task, you're doubtful and skeptical that you've completed it effectively. All of these are things that undercut usability in terms of it needing to be a seemingly seamless, easy, comfortable, in some cases, enjoyable experience that allows you to achieve an objective. What's going on and why are these differences causing such consternation? That's what I'd like to look at and talk about a bit today, the nature of those facets. And so to put things into perspective, I'd like to talk about how your brain processes information a bit. Um, when you think about it, most of us can engage in incredibly complex activities, seemingly on autopilot. Um, if you drive from home to work, you can navigate a rather complex roading system uh, with other objects moving around you in the environment from pedestrians to cyclists to cars, uh, navigate different intersections, make different turns, register traffic lights, sometimes while listening to the radio or a book on tape, or sometimes while talking to someone in the passenger seat next to you while listening to the radio. Those are all incredibly complicated processes. How are we doing it in our brain not overloading trying to process it all? It has to do with the fact a huge amount of our daily routine tasks are done on autopilot. They exist at a very subconscious level. And by keeping certain tasks that are routine at the subconscious, it frees up our conscious mind to do other things, novel things, like engage in a conversation while driving a familiar route, like listen to a book while driving to a particular location that we know. So what's going on here that makes this possible? It has to do with how our brains process information when we encounter it. And so what I'd like to look at is the encounter experience and the specific mental models our brains have developed to address these factors and turn habitual use into reflexive reaction that guides about 90% of what we do when we use things. Essentially, the first time we encounter an object, our mind reflexively instantly has to engage in three interconnected processes to work. The first thing it's got to do is it's got to recognize or be able to identify the thing that's just drawn our attention. I hold something up, I see it, I need to know what it is. Now, recognition is the first part in a very complicated puzzle. Once I recognize something, I need to categorize it. That is, I need to know what it does or what it is used for. Categorization. If you will, I recognize I'm in a hotel lobby. Categorization, what do I do in a hotel lobby? I engage in a series of different tasks associated with staying in a hotel. Now the key question becomes, which of these many different tasks do I need to perform at this moment in this space? That's operationalization or operationalizing. What's the specific thing I need to do with this thing in this space? Or what's the specific thing I need to do in this particular location? 
my brain's got to understand where I am, know what my options are, pick the specific option instantaneously. And to do this, we tend to default to a mental modeling structure called a prototype, which looks at how we organize sensory input into manageable units so our brain can process them seemingly reflexively. So let's look at these prototypes and what they mean in terms of how we process data. So the first part of the puzzle is recognition. Um, do we recognize something? Two kinds of things. Particularly, do we recognize objects and do we recognize people? And it turns out every human everywhere learns this recognition process in a common way. It occurs from when we're very, very early language learners all the way through our adulthood. But we tend to learn these concepts similarly. The first thing is we encounter a new object. And I'm gonna use it akin to someone learning a language for the first time. Um, so let's say, oops, advance please. Excuse me one second. There we go. Let's say you see an object that looks like this for the first time. Someone has to identify it for you. This is a pen. We call this object a pen. So we begin the recognition process. Now, but the first time we see this thing, we get a bit overwhelmed because we look at this object, this pen and say, I've got to remember all of these different features to know what this thing is. That's an awful lot. Now, over the course of our lives, through our experience, as in user experience design, um, we begin to learn that there are different kinds of pens and different incarnations of them out there, but they all share in common certain minimal characteristics that make them pens in our society. Um, they all have a common shape. They're all cylindrical in nature and small enough generally to fit in one hand comfortably. More importantly, they've got other common features. Um, the two ends of the pen are different. One is tapered and used for writing. The other is rounded or flattened. But that specific shape is common across every different iteration I see for a pen. Now, in some cases, there might be the variation of like a clip for uh, securing it to pockets. That's not always the case, but when you think about it, what we do is we take this concept of pen and we reduce it to incredibly minimal sensory input. In this case, visual input, but if someone is visually impaired or blind, it could be sensory input. What does a pen feel like when I hold it in my hand? So I recognize minimal sensory factors to identify it. So what we do basically is say, okay, we're gonna create a mental category shortcut that says every time I see something that has these minimal features, it's cylindrical, it's pointed at one end, it's rounded or squared at the other end, we're gonna call this a pen. And that's how we recognize it. That way we don't have to process all the sensory information we get at once. So what does this mean? It affects how we recognize things in the world around us in one of two ways. Either I can say to you, can you go find the pen in the other room for me? Or I can say, just look around and see what you find. The same thing is going to happen. The first thing is if I said, go look for the pen, you'll pop up this prototype, this mental model that says, this is what I think a pen should look like. This is my idealized version of it. And for each new object we encounter, we're going to compare it to that pen, that mental model, and we're gonna say how many of the basic essential features does that object have in common? Uh, I see this object, it's a hammer, is this a pen? Well, when I look at it, it is technically the right shape, it is cylindrical, and it can kind of sort of fit in my hand, but there's certain other things, other very key characteristics that don't match up. It doesn't have that pointed end on one side or that rounded or squared off end. In fact, its terminal points on both ends are extremely different. I'm not quite sure what this is. And then we look for other objects. I'm looking for a pen in this case. So we see something else. Is this a pen? Again, we compare it to our mental visual model or our mental sensory model. Yeah, it's got the same basic shape. And in this case, it's got the same key minimal characteristics I associate with a pen. So yeah, the match there is quite close. I know what this thing is, it's a pen. And based upon this matching of these minimal characteristics, or they're called threshold characteristics, a certain number have to be present to identify it. I know what this is, this is a pen. And this other thing, well, I don't know what it is, but I know it's not a pen. I'll have to open up a different prototype or compare it to a different prototype for another object to recognize it. But this is the basic foundational process we use to recognize everything from objects to people to places. 
I get sensory input, in this case visual, from that thing. I compare it to what the mental model I have for what it should look like, the minimal characteristics it should have. If it has enough characteristics in common, I can identify it and know what it does. And all of this happens at the subconscious in a split second. Now, where it becomes important is it begins to explain problems with seeing variation. So in this example, if I say, go find the pen in the other room, or you'll need to use a pen to sign in at the check-in desk, and you look around and this is all you see, there's gonna be a disconnect there. In some cases, you're going to say, well, I think maybe the quill thing could be a pen, but I'm not 100% sure. Those other two things, I'm not sure what they are, and I'm not quite sure how to use them, but I'm gonna keep looking for a pen and bypass them. And just for the record, these are all novelty pens. But because they deviate so greatly from that idealized representation, those minimal characteristics of pen, we tend to overlook them. And this is kind of the classic first failing, if you will, in usability. If you can't recognize something or identify it, you can't use it. And if you can't use it, the whole game is blown. And so this is where prototypes become important. They're sort of the gateway um, cognitive function that helps us engage in usability. Do I know what something is? Do I know where I am? These expectations of what things should look like based on prototypes have pronounced implications for new technologies or new things. Um, in this case, this is a new technology. And the creators of it have thought that it looks enough like something else that its use should be self-obvious. They sh people should know what it is and therefore be able to figure out what it does. Now, when you present this to individuals who've never seen this kind of technology before and ask them, what is this thing? You'll get everything from it's a high-tech remote control to it might be some kind of cell phone device to it could be a stamp that's used at places like nightclubs to register that you've attended the place in the back of your hand. In truth, this thing is called a stethy, and it is a digital stethoscope. And how it works is you position it, place that bell-shaped unit over the patient's heart, and it records their, their pulse, uh, excuse me, their heartbeat the same way an uh, analog stethoscope would. But the creators of this object thought that, well, it's got one feature in common with stethoscope, that bell shape at one end, but it doesn't meet enough of the minimal threshold characteristics for people to reflexively identify it. So most individuals have no idea what this technology does. As a result, they have no idea how to use it. And this is where these prototypes begin to cause issues with usability. So the first rule is what are people looking for? Or what are they expecting to see or centrally encounter when they enter a space to perform a process? So things are, we've got to categorize them or how do we use certain things? And this is based on experience. Um, none of us intuitively knows how to use a pen. Rather, what we do is in the course of our lives, we observe of how other people used it or individuals instruct us in how to use it to perform different processes. We might be taught that a pen is something that is used for writing and we will teach you how to use that pen to create letters and combine them into words on a page. So this is learned associated function. In other cases, we might have partial, we might have begun to figure out that if we scribble and scrawl things, we can draw images with this pen. And in other cases, people might say, that's pretty good. Let me show you some techniques on how to refine what you're doing randomly there to make it more, more uh, recognizable as art. So with things like art, you've got this mixed approach where it is both learned and acquired behavior. You kind of notice, try by doing, and other people instruct you into it. And then we have completely observed or completely acquired behavior where we watch other people use pens repeatedly in certain contexts to sign receipts when you check into hotels, to sign receipts when you go to restaurants, to sign receipts when you purchase something. And based upon seeing that, we begin to model the behavior. I've seen people do this, I know I can do this, but this is how we learn to use things. So the second rule is nothing is inherently usable. And if we have to be either formally instructed or passively observe over time how to use things. But the key question becomes, which use? Because in any possible setting, you could perform any of these features. How do we know the specific use of this object at this time? And this is where we get to our third part of the equation, this oper operationalization or to operationalize. This is based on context of use. 
the mind looks at where you are to figure out how to use things to accomplish activities or how to narrow down the scope of your use, usability. To go back to the hotel check-in desk model, here's how things kind of work. You walk into a space and the visual features of the space automatically identify it as a particular location. This looks like a, a hotel check-in lobby. I know what this is. I know what to do here. Based upon that, we know that this prototype for check-in lobby has got certain features inherent to it, certain design aspects we expect to be there for it to be the place it is to identify it. There are people like check-in clerks, there are objects like computers and pens. And when we know these things are there, we know that in this context, they're used in a very specific way. In the case of this particular example that we used before, we can't figure out how to do anything because we can't recognize it. If we can't recognize it, we don't know how to categorize it. We don't know what it does because we don't know what it is. So even if we're in the right space, we don't know how to operationalize it. We still can't figure it out. So this is what causes the distinction. So back to our hotel example, this is why there's the common desire to make spaces look as similar as is possible, because we need to trigger the user's prototype for place, the specific mental model we have for a location that helps us identify things and triggers the, the series of reflexes that tells us what's going to be there, what to do and how to use it. So it's very important to know what that mental model is. But once we know it, the brain kicks into autopilot. I know where I am. I know what will be there that I need to use to perform a process. I know what I will be expected to do or how I expect to use that object in that space to perform that process. I perform reflexively. It's a cascading effect. One prototype opens another prototype, opens another. Prototype of place opens prototype of objects I expect to be there, opens prototype for activity I expect to perform with object. This series is called a cascading prototype. And this is how our brain performs a huge number of activities seemingly reflexively. We kick into autopilot the moment we recognize something, access what we expect it to look at its potential functions, figure out what space it's in, access how to use it in that space, and everything simply slides in all at the subconscious level. But this reflexive process is why usability can break down if any part of that cascade is broken. If I don't know where I am because I can't recognize the space, if I don't know what something is because I can't recognize it, I can't use something, I can't engage in a process because I'm totally lost. So what do these kinds of factors mean in terms of how we design and think about the world? Um, the basic equation for usability in a brute force way is usability equals space plus stuff. Determining the usability of something is figuring out where you are and how you identify that location. And then once identified, what do you expect to be there to perform tasks in that location? And what do those things, what do you expect them to look like so you can recognize them and know how to use them in that space. And the process kind of works as follows from an office perspective. Um, we're meeting at the workplace and I ask you, can you please go down to my office and call our client to let that client know what's going on? Automatically, your mind pops up office. An office is something that looks like this. And you will search for that thing, that space that resembles this particular thing. Now notice that office based on the mental prototype you have for place is going to have specific things in it. You know these things will be there because they're inherent to identifying something as an office. One of the things you know is going to be there is going to be a phone because you've seen enough offices over time to know that there will be a phone there that identifies it as an office. Now, when I tell you go down to my office and call the client, you know what to look for and how to use it. Now here's the funny thing. That phone that is popping up on the slide right now most of us have seen those before in an office context. And why that's important is we come to associate this particular visual representation or sensory representation of phone with office use. And a lot of us will reflexively pick the, the receiver up, dial nine to get an outside line and punch in a number. We don't know why, but for some odd reason, we've been prompted to do that. The design of the phone over time, we've learned through our experiences how to operate the thing. So it is reflexive. And even if we don't know dial nine, most of us realize with this kind of phone, I've got to figure out how to get an outside line. So we might call the operator or we might ask someone, how do you call outside? But it's reflexive behavior. What's interesting is if this was a rotary dial phone in your office, 
then the whole model is thrown off because the object prototype you have for office phone does not match. I'm not supposed to have a rotary dial phone. I have no idea how to call out on this. Do you not know how to use a rotary dial phone? Well, I do, but not in this context. I'm not sure how to get an outside line or what to do. Flip it, if you were to walk into someone's home and they had this kind of a, a comm system or phone in their office, you might default to, oh, so you work from home. Oh, or you have a home office because the design of the object triggers a specific use. So those are those prototypes kicking in. They don't just apply to physical spaces, they apply to metaphysical as well. They affect how we use printed documents. Um, and when you think about it, when we talk about written texts, we speak about them like spaces. What is going on in the story? What is going on in the text? We speak about it as though it's a location because as far as our mind is concerned, it is. Whenever you read a text, you create mental images or sensory images of what you think is going on in a space there. And it's the same thing with the text. Now, what's weird about that is in this space, we expect there to be certain objects designed a certain way to perform a process. Many of us expect if it's a technical manual, it will have a table of contents. We expect that item to be there and we know how to use it to locate information in a text. If it's not, we get very upset or very confused. Um, and for folks who have worked with different cultures, you'll notice that the table of contents can sometimes appear in the front of a text or in the back of it, depending on the culture. And it can cause huge miscommunications or usage problems where one person says, I can't use this, I don't know where the table of contents is. And someone else says, have you looked in the back or the front of the book? Oh, I didn't expect it there. But so powerful is this expectation, we won't even check alternatives because we expect it to be a certain way. This also explains why for many of us, we feel uncomfortable with books who, when they're divided into chapters, the chapter isn't clearly identified. Or maybe the chapter is just numbered but not named. We feel a bit queasy about it. Or maybe it's named and not numbered. But we've got a particular prototype for what a chapter should look like. And again, if it doesn't meet that prototype, we feel uncomfortable using it. Same thing applies to digital spaces, like interfaces. Um, excuse me. We have a mobile phone. We have a website. We have a piece of software. It is treated in our mind like a space. We expect that space to have certain tools, items, objects in it that we use. We need to be able to recognize those objects readily to perform a process in a space. I expect every mobile phone to have an app that lets me call other mobile phones or other phone lines. That's a given. It's part of the prototype for mobile phone space. I expect that mobile phone app to look a specific way. And while many of us have probably not used an analog phone, and some of us never seen an analog phone, we recognize this symbol for some reason as call phone. We know what it is, we know how to use it. So this is how these deep-seated expectations of space plus stuff we expect to find there and how to use it, how they drive our usability expectations. So essentially, understanding and addressing these mental factors, these cognitive processes with usability involves identifying three things in this cascading order. Context, content, construct. The context is all about identifying where is the user when they're trying to perform a task. That's going to be key that begins our model. It triggers the prototype of place that initiates the cascade. The next thing we need to know is content. What does the user expect to be in that location to perform this process? They have very distinct expectations because their prototype for place said these features should be there. They're going to expect them and they'll reflexively use them. Construct. The things in that space, to be able to use them to achieve a task, the user has to be able to reflexively identify them. How do they need to be designed to allow for that kind of instant recognition? So these become the three parts of the cascade that we as researchers need to study. Essentially, the process is mapping. It's recreating that mental model, that prototype that guides how people use things to design for it. And it begins by asking the primary question, well, what object, objective, or what task? What are you trying to achieve or what are you trying to do? First thing, so let's begin there. What's the objective? Because once I know what you're trying to do, my follow-up question is, where do you expect to do it? And this is where we begin to understand the cascade. So it's a matter of, you don't just perform a process anywhere randomly. It occurs in a specific place at a point in time. Where is it? 
So where do you do it? Now I need you to recreate that prototype to me. Describe the environment to me. Tell me what it looks like so I know how you conceive of it. And if I need to either recreate it as an image that's used to supplement the text or use it as a guide when I write a text for you to understand, I know what you look for when you use something. And specifically what I'm trying to figure out is in this space, what particular things are you looking for specifically that identify it as a space and help you perform a process in that space? Okay, so I know where you are. Now I've got to get on to the next part. What things do you expect to use? And so this is our second round of prototypes in the cascade. So what do you use in that setting to perform this function? Can you describe that item to me? Explain to me what it looks like. Explain to me what it feels like. Again, I need to re recreate a sensory-based picture or sensory-based representation of what that person expects something to be so they can recognize it and know what to do with it. Then the third part is I need to figure out how it's operationalized in that setting. And this brings me to the next or final rounds of questions. So talk me through this process. Explain to me what you are doing. What do you do and describe the things you're using? And why this becomes important is we can't intuitively assume that because someone recognizes something, we know how they're going to use it someplace. Again, we're back to that operationalization. We need to have them show us so we've got a feel for it. We also want them to talk us through the process because it could be that the visual features or the sensory features they use to identify a space are not the same ones they associate with performing a process in a space. Um, we don't use the feature of pen to identify a hotel lobby. We do, however, expect to use pens as part of a process in registering at a hotel. The only way to find that out is to have you talk through the process and realize, oh, you've just identified something different from what you'd mentioned before. I need to keep track of that. In terms of researching this, um, the key there is you need to get information on these mental models directly from individuals themselves. And so this involves individuals with your user group, inter individuals, interviews with your user group, or focus group with the audience that you wish to design something for to figure out what their prototypes are for space, for people, for objects, and to understand how this all cascades so they can use things in a space. Ideally, you'll take this data and look for patterns across users and come up with wireframes. These wireframes could be visual representations or pictures for what, say, the space looks like. Is this what an office looks like? Is this what a phone looks like? And then you can have a, a sample group of those users user test it. What is this space? Do you, can you recognize it? What needs to be modified so you can recognize it as an office? Is this a phone, an office phone? If not, how do I need to modify it so you can recognize how to use it? Here's a sample interface. Can you show me how you would use it? How can you recognize it? But the idea is we create these initial prototypes that we think guide at user action. We then test them with members of the related audience and we fine tune through iterative testing to the point of where we know what their mental models are. And again, depending upon the, the sensory channel the users rely on, to get input from their environment, the, proto the wireframes we create mirror those things. Is it sound? Is it touch? Is it sight? And we test to see if we've got it correct. So in short, whenever it comes to cognition and usability, it's great to think about the user, but we have to understand their experience in terms of a number of variables. We need to know where they are when they do something. We need to know what specific features or characteristics need to be in that space so they can recognize that space and begin the cascade of prototypes that leads to reflexive use. We need to know in that space, what do they expect to use to perform activities? And we need to identify their specific expectations of what something should look like so they can recognize it and trigger the process for operationalizing or using materials in a space. So that's kind of an overview of the cognitive aspects that go into usability that can either make a process reflexive and make designs highly usable or make a process counterintuitive and stop individuals from using things altogether. Um, thank you all very much for your time and for the chance to chat with you today. Um, in going through these different concepts, I've 
going over a number of different ideas. This is the reference list I've been drawing from for these concepts. I'm happy to share this with folks, as well as the slides if they'd like to learn more about these ideas. And now I'd like to open the floor up to any questions that folks might have. Um, if you want to type questions into the chat box, I'm happy to read them off and then respond to them. Thank you all. At this time, any questions? Well, thank, thank you all for your kind words. I'm glad that folks enjoyed it. Actually, Kirk, I had an observation um, yes, before please. you ran away. Um, uh -huh. I'm an old time comic book fan and mm. I adore Scott McCloud's books, Understanding yes. Comics. Uh -huh. um, how, how much of the um, how much of that book, Understanding Comics, would I, I assume that you um, uh, have heard of it or read it? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And so how much of that would you say would apply to technical documentation to user documentation and usability? Because mm -hmm. I'm um, seeing a whole lot. Uh, great question. I think surprisingly more than most people realize. Um, in fact, I'd say the majority of it. And hear, hear me out, I'm going to be a total geek right now. Um, one of the, like of all the different kinds of neurological connections we have in our brain, we've got this weird set of nerves called mirror neurons. And they are, um, if you've ever watched a movie and seen somebody get hit or something physically happen to them and you feel their pain, that's your motor neurons triggering. Those are the same neurons that you use whenever you see somebody do something, you know how to do it. And what, why those are called mirror neurons is the same neurons that you use to observe something are the neurons you use to process that same activity. So as far as your brain is concerned, seeing is doing. Now, why that becomes important in terms of communication and usability is when you read a book or when you read instructions, your mind literally opens up a visual depiction, well, if it's your sighted, a visual depiction or a sensory depiction of what is going on and your body literally engages in that activity or it thinks it's engaging in that activity. And this is why that, that connection between how we perceive things is so important to usability because we're, we're relying on these representations we've built over time through experience to determine what we think is going on. Um, so th that's what's key there is understanding that nothing is inherently neutral, if you will, but rather we bring to it our interpretation of how we think experiences will play out based upon how we conceptualize things and how our brain makes us think we're acting as we conceptualize. I hope that made sense. That did, and that explained some, some things I'd wondered about um, with uh, helping people um, mm -hmm. and helping friends uh, use technology and other things. Mm -hmm. It, the funky thing is for most of us, like if you read an instruction manual, if you can't, if you're sighted, if you can't visualize what you're reading about, you can't perform the process because the neurological pathways that are essential to performing can't trigger. There's no visual stimulus to prompt them. And nothing imprints or embed, or very little will imprint or embed. And that's the point at which you say to somebody, can you show me what this does or can you show me what it's doing? Um, so that's kind of where that process comes in, if you will. Um, let's see. A couple, uh, thank you, folks. I've got some really cool questions kind of propping up on the text. Um, someone asked, who said uh, nothing is inherently usable? Um, I'm going to pull that from a gentleman called Arnold Pacey, um, who studies technology and evolution and design. And his idea is whenever we build things or technologies, um, we have an idea of how we think people are going to use them. And we design for what we think people are going to use them to do. And then we assume that people can intuit backwards what something is. Um, and so Hui Tong Sung, who does a lot with localization and technology, looks at that same phenomenon. But it's this idea that we create things thinking we know how people are going to use them based on our experiences. Sometimes that's the case if our experiences are the same. But the idea that you can drop something in front of somebody that they've never seen before and never used before, and they can just figure out what it does, is almost nil most of us will take a parallel experience. This, this golf cart looks a lot like a car. 
and I know how to drive a car, so I'm gonna pull in my previous experience driving a car to figure out how to drive a golf cart. Um, that mapping we do a, a lot of the time with new things, which is why it's really important for new things to look like old things, so we can just draw over the previous prototypes and modify them slightly. If we've got no cognitive prototype foundation to reach back on and try to form from, we're completely lost. We don't really know what to do with the thing. So that's kind of where that notion comes from. Great question. Um, uh, someone else noticed, you know, there are times when I'm driving that I've got to turn the radio off. Um, that's, a, that's a great example. Um, here's, here's basically how it works. The, if you do something repeatedly, you're relying on your subconscious to do it. We can all, most of us drive from home to work reflexively. In fact, we won't even notice we're doing it because we're on autopilot and that frees up our conscious mind to do other things like listen to music. The moment we don't know where we are, our brain shifts gears, pardon the pun. And we go from subconscious to conscious thinking. And our conscious mind has a limited number of sensory inputs it can process at once. And we very quickly begin to overload because we're trying to take in visual signals from the world around us to figure out where we are. And we've got this radio in the background that's sending in sound input that we have to process at the same time. It's too much, we have information overload. We've got to limit the number of sources of sensory input, we turn off the radio. And so that's why a trip from home to work, talking to a colleague, listening to the radio, everything is fine. A trip in New York City at rush hour, if we've never been there before, the radio is off and the person sitting next to you better not say a word. And that's kind of what prompts those differences in behavior. Great question. Um, someone asked about the, the digital stethoscope model. Um, in that case, what, what you reveal from that is the, the threshold for prototypes. For the stethy technology, it had the bell for listening, but it didn't have the two connecting pieces for hearing. So you've got the auditory input, but not the auditory output. Uh, um, and so modified versions need to have something like a, um, a tethered, a wire or connecting tube that looks like that same connector you see in an analog stethoscope that physicians then place in their ears. And those could even be like the plugs that plug into the computer or the mobile phone that transmits that data out. But by paralleling those very similar designs, people suddenly say, oh, this is some kind of stethoscope technology. So it's knowing what that next step is and kind of realizing these thresholds of characteristics for identification, they tend to vary, but most of us through common experiences have the same similar thresholds. And this kind of research identifies it. What are the minimal characteristics for recognizing what something is? Um, let's see. Uh, someone mentioned, uh, Han, you has a book about uh, the other kind of funnies where she talks about the use of comics and cartoons in relation to technical communication. And it's, it's a good read. And I, I suggest, you know, that, that area, visual design, comic books, the psychology of visualization, or basically sensory input. Um, again, we're back to, it's not about visuals as it is sensory input. If we're sighted, then most of our sensory input we process as visual. If we're not, that sensory input could be sonic through sound or tactile through touch. But that sensory input is going to be there and it's going to form a, a minimal set of characteristics we use to identify things. So even with issues like accessibility, recognition is based upon the audience. What do they expect this thing to feel like, sound like, but they're gonna have an imprint there, a, a, a series of characteristics that they say, these are the minimal that's needed to identify this thing. And it's knowing what those are. Cool, I think that's, let's see. Someone asked about, uh, are young people more sort of open-minded to gizmos? Um, yes and no. I, I think the, the question there, learning to use something is, again, you're shown it for the first time, you're shown what it does, you're shown how to use it. For most of us, as new technologies come out, we need to modify our existing models to adapt to what something should be. And that can be, that can take some time. Um, if you're my age, you grew up with, you know, the rotary dial phone that hang, hung on the wall. And there was a fixed cord with a fixed, you know, physical receiver. And that was the phone that, and you know how to use it. And as you move from rotary dial to push button to, you had to keep making these adjustments in how you thought about things. And that gets exhausting after a while. And it's more difficult because you're continually overwriting previous versions to update them. For the digital generation, if you will, if you grow up and your model 
for understanding things is the baseline of digital technology, the amount of adaptation you have to do in balancing experiences to come up with expectations of usability is very different. And so that tends to be what's going on with younger people learning how to use technology more quickly. Um, they, their framework adapts more readily because they have less kind of balancing a previous experience to deal with and more direct observation in how to use something. And you see that generationally, or not just generation in terms of age, but exposure to technology. And so that's the key factor. At what point does this technology enter kind of your, your system or your, your lifespan? And at that point, how evolved is it and how does it continue to evolve, which affects how you're going to adapt the way you think about things? I hope that made sense. Any other questions? Let's see, someone asked patient. I wonder if this internal prototype allows you to introduce new products. Yes, um, someone asked if you modify prototypes, can you modify them later on? Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna geek out again. Um, in, in engineering, there's this concept called a lock-in. And that is the idea that you build a technology to meet the conditions exactly as they are now and with the thought that they'll never get modified again. Um, why is it that uh, most subway systems don't have air conditioning? That's because whenever they built the tunnels for subway cars to move through, they built them at the exact size that the subway car at that point in time needed to be to move through them. So there was no extra space in the size of a subway tunnel to add refrigeration units to the top of cars. Hence, you got no air conditioning. Um, that's a lock-in. And the same thing with technologies, with the Stethi, for example. If that device was designed in such a way that there was no way to easily modify it to add the um, connecting wires that makes it look like the earpieces on a regular stethoscope, then you've literally got to either rebuild that technology to allow for that ad adaptation or come up with something completely new. But the idea is technology will never be fixed. Nothing is ever fixed or it's frozen in time. It will keep evolving and how do you develop technologies, how do you develop the documentation that supports technologies, how do you develop content management systems to be flexible and adaptable over time so that as mental models change, we can change the technology to mirror them. And that becomes the kind of the challenge. You can't predict it, but leaving enough openness to allow for modification is what's key. Great questions. Um, Right quick, a simple experiment, if you have the time over the weekend, it, to try out and see. But to illustrate this point, um, go and look at an old-fashioned uh, telephone, like from the turn of the previous century. And if you'll notice, most of them are these, they're, they're boxes of wood, and they're rectangular boxes of wood, you know, about, you know, 12 inches high and about four, six inches wide. And if you look at the configuration of, um, the interface or the phone, there are two ringer bells which are positioned in the top middle together right next to each other. And there's a mouthpiece which is positioned below the ringer bells about four inches beneath it. And if you look at it, you realize this is a face. What's going on here? Well, it turns out, depending upon who you speak with, but the, the legend, if you will, is that when the first telephone technology came out, people had no mental model for talking to disembodied voices other than phantom ghost specter something else. And there was a fear about this technology because the conversations didn't happen with disembodied voices. So to get people to use the telephone, they needed to mirror the, the mental model they had for face-to-face -face conversation. Hence, those early telephones were designed to look like faces. The rectangular structure is about the same shape of a face. They are placed on a wall or on a post about the same point off the ground where the human head would be. The two bells mimic eyes and the positioning of the speaker mimics a mouth. So you're mirroring talking to someone and it's kind of like adapting it in. After people become accustomed to talking to disembodied voices, you can begin to modify the design of the phone away from the face into something else. But you first gotta help create these transitional prototypes that help people move from one major technological shift in doing things to another. Um, it, it's akin to like, if you're my age, you remember the old audio recorders that had a red button for record and a white or gray button for play and you had to press them both. And then forever after, it seemed like every recording technology, whether it was a video recorder or some other recorder, needed both a play and a record button to use. And the record button was always red. 
Um, even today, most of us have recording devices on our phones and the record button is red for many of them. Where did that come from? The button could just as easily be purple or yellow or blue. Why is it red? We carry down these sort of design principles that help us transition from one technological incarnation to the next. And so just things to think about in developing things. Thank you all very much. I, I think I've taken the full time. I appreciate the chance to speak with you. If you have questions, um, my email is there. I'm happy to share my slides. Just feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirk. That was, I mean, it's really thought provoking. I'm very interested in checking up on um, other uh, podcasts, et cetera, on this uh, topic. Um, we'll be taking a break um, for lunch. We'll be coming back at one o'clock um, with Jack Molisani, um, who is always a wonderful speaker. Um, we're going to <laughs> we're going to go ahead and leave this channel open. Um, so if you want to text chat or unmute your mics and uh, chat. Um, that's wonderful. We will be muting uh, for Jack's presentation, um, unless you really want people to horn in, Jack. Um, this presentation is not as interactive as others that I've done, um, but I always want people to ask questions, so you can leave people unmuted. Okay. Okay, we'll see everybody back at uh, one o'clock. Thank you. So, ready? Mm -hmm. Ready. All right. Ready. Okay, so we're going to talk about the 10 most common mistakes professionals make when looking for work. Um, content professionals, tech writers, content strategists, anybody in the 